Hello friends and welcome to the first of two installments in this reading of the adventures of Winnie the Pooh. Today I will be reading for you chapters 1 through 5. This reading is available in two versions, one with the sound of gentle rain and one without. Let us find a place where we can safely relax and listen to this story. Winnie the Pooh Chapter 1 In which we are introduced to Winnie the Pooh and some bees, and the stories begin. Here is Edward Bear, coming downstairs now. Bump, bump, bump on the back of his head, behind Christopher Robin. It is, as far as he knows, the only way of coming downstairs. But sometimes he feels that there really is another way. If only he could stop bumping for a moment and think of it. And then he feels that perhaps there isn't. Anyhow, here he is at the bottom, and ready to be introduced to you, Winnie the Pooh. When I first heard his name, I said, just as you are going to say, but I thought he was a boy. So did I, said Christopher Robin. Then you can't call him Winnie? I don't. But you said... He's Winnie the Pooh. Don't you know what there means? Ah, yes, now I do, I said quickly. And I hope you do too, because it is all the explanation you are going to get. Sometimes Winnie the Pooh likes a game of some sort when he comes downstairs. And sometimes he likes to sit quietly in front of the fire and listen to a story. This evening, what about a story? said Christopher Robin. What about the story? I said. Could you very well sweetly tell Winnie the Pooh one? I suppose I could, I said. What sort of stories does he like? About himself, because he's that sort of bear. Oh, I see. So could you, very sweetly? I'll try, I said. So I tried. Once upon a time, a very long time ago now, about last Friday, Winnie the Pooh lived in a forest all by himself under the name of Sanders. What does under the name mean? asked Christopher Robin. It means he had the name over the door in gold letters and lived under it. Winnie the Pooh wasn't quite sure, said Christopher Robin. Now I am, said a growly voice. Then I will go on, said I. One day, when he was out walking, he came to an open place in the middle of the forest, and in the middle of this place was a large oak tree, and from the top of the tree there came a loud buzzing noise. Winnie the Pooh sat down at the foot of the tree, put his head between his paws, and began to think. First of all, he said to himself, That buzzing noise means something. You don't get a buzzing noise like that, 
just buzzing and buzzing, without its meaning something. If there's a buzzing noise, somebody's making a buzzing noise. And the only reason for making a buzzing noise that I know of is because you're a bee. Then he thought another long time and said, And the only reason for being a bee that I know of is making honey. And then he got up and said, And the only reason for making honey is so as I can eat it. So he began to climb the tree. He climbed, and he climbed, and he climbed, and as he climbed, he sang a little song to himself. It went like this. Isn't it funny how a bear likes honey? Buzz, 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 I wonder why he does. Then he climbed a little further, and a little further, and then just a little further. By that time he had thought of another song. It's a very funny thought that if bears were bees, they'd build a nest at the bottom of trees. And that being so, if the bees were bears, we shouldn't have to climb up all these stairs. He was getting rather tired by this time, so that is why he sang a complaining song. He was nearly there now, and if he just stood on that branch, crack. Oh, help, said Pooh, as he dropped ten feet on the branch below him. If only I hadn't, he said as he bounced twenty feet on to the next branch. You see, what I meant to do, he explained as he turned head over heels and crashed onto another branch thirty feet below. What I meant to do. Of course, it was, rather. He admitted as he slithered very quickly through the next six branches. It all comes, I suppose, he decided as he said goodbye to the last branch spun around three times and flew gracefully into a gorse bush. It all comes of liking honey so much. Oh, help! He crawled out of the gorse bush, brushed the prickles from his nose, and began to think again. And the first person he thought of was Christopher Robin. Was that me? said Christopher Robin in an odd voice, hardly daring to believe it. That was you. Christopher Robin said nothing, but his eyes got larger and larger, and his face got pinker and pinker. So Winnie the Pooh went round to his friend Christopher Robin, who lived behind the green door in another part of the forest. Good morning, Christopher Robin, he said. Good morning, Winnie the Pooh, said you. I wonder if you've got such a thing as a balloon about you. A balloon? Yes, I just said to myself coming along. I wonder if Christopher Robin has such a thing as a balloon about him. I just said it to myself, thinking of balloons and wondering. What do you want a balloon for? you said. Winnie the Pooh looked round to see that nobody was listening, put his paw to his mouth, and said in a deep whisper, Honey! But you don't get honey with balloons. I do, said Pooh. Well, it just happened that you had been to a party the day before at the house of your friend Piglet. And you had balloons at the party. You had had a big green balloon, 
and one of Rabbit's relations had had a big blue one and had left it behind, being really too young to go to a party at all. And so you had brought the green one and the blue one home with you. Which one would you like? he asked Pooh. He put his head between his paws and thought very carefully. It's like this, he said. When you go after honey with a balloon, the great thing is not to let the bees know you're coming. Now, if you have a green balloon, they might think you were only part of the tree and not notice you. And if you have a blue balloon, they might think you were only part of the sky and not notice you. And the question is, which is most likely? Wouldn't they notice you underneath the balloon, you asked? They might, or they might not, said Winnie the Pooh. You never can tell with bees. He thought for a moment and said, I shall try to look like a small black cloud. That will deceive them. Then you had better have the blue balloon, you said, and so it was decided. Well, you both went out with the blue balloon, and you took your gun with you, just in case, as you always did, and Winnie the Pooh went to a very muddy place that he knew of, and rolled and rolled until he was black all over. And then, when the balloon was blown up as big as big, and you and Pooh were both holding on to the string, you let go suddenly, and Pooh Bear floated gracefully up into the sky, and stayed there, level with the top of the tree, and about twenty feet away from it. Hooray! you shouted. Isn't that fine? shouted Winnie the Pooh down to you. What do I look like? You look like a bear holding onto a balloon, you said. Not, said Pooh anxiously, not like a small black cloud in a blue sky? Not very much. Ah, well, perhaps from up here it looks different. And, as I say, you never can tell with bees. There was no wind to blow him nearer to the tree, so there he stayed. He could see the honey, he could smell the honey, but he couldn't quite reach the honey. After a little while, he called down to you. Christopher Robin, he said in a loud whisper. Hello, I think the bees suspect something. What sort of thing? I don't know, but something tells me that they're suspicious. Perhaps they think that you're after the honey. It may be you never can tell with bees. And there was another little silence, and then he called down to you again. Christopher Robin? Yes? Have you an umbrella in your house? I think so. I wish you would bring it out here and walk up and down with it, and look up at me every now and then and say, Tut, tut, it looks like rain. I think if you did that, it would help the deception which we are practicing on these bees. Well, you laughed to yourself, silly old bear, but you didn't say it aloud, because you were so fond of him, and you went home for your umbrella. Oh, there you are, called down Winnie the Pooh as soon as you got back to the tree. I was beginning to get anxious. I have discovered that the bees are now definitely suspicious. Shall I put my umbrella up, you said. Yes, but wait a moment. We must be practical. The important bee to deceive is the queen bee. Can you see which is the queen bee from down there? 
Well, now, if you walk up and down with your umbrella, saying, tut, tut, it looks like rain, I shall do what I can by singing a little cloud song, such as a cloud might sing. Go. So, while you walked up and down, and wondered if it would rain, Winnie the Pooh sang this song. How sweet to be a cloud floating in the blue, every little cloud always sings aloud. How sweet to be a cloud floating in the blue, it makes him very proud to be a little cloud. The bees were still buzzing as suspiciously as ever. Some of them, indeed, left the nests and flew all round the cloud as it began the second verse of this song. And one bee sat down on the nose of the cloud for a moment, and then got up again. Christopher, oh, Robin, called out the cloud. Yes? I have just been thinking, and I have come to a very important decision. These are the wrong sort of bees. Are they? Quite the wrong sort. So I should think they make the wrong sort of honey. Shouldn't you? Would they? Yes. So I think I shall come down. How? asked you. Winnie the Pooh hadn't thought about this. If he let go of the string, he would fall, bump, and he didn't like the idea of that. So he thought for a long time, and then said, Christopher Robin, you must shoot the balloon with your gun. Have you got your gun? Of course I have, you said. But if I do that, it will spoil the balloon, you said. But if you don't, said Pooh, I shall have to let go, and that would spoil me. When he put it like this, you saw how it was, and you aimed very carefully at the balloon, and fired. Oh, said Pooh, did I miss, you asked. You didn't exactly miss, said Pooh, but you missed the balloon. I'm so sorry, you said, and you fired again. And this time you hit the balloon, and the air came slowly out. And Winnie the Pooh floated down to the ground. But his arms were so stiff from holding on to the string of the balloon all that time, that they stayed up straight in the air for more than a week. And whenever a fly came and settled on his nose, he had to blow it off. And I think, but I am not sure, that that is why he was always called Pooh. Is that the end of the story? asked Christopher Robin. That's the end of that one. There are others. About Pooh and me, and Piglet, and Rabbit, and all of you. Don't you remember? I do remember, and then when I try to remember, I forget. That day, when Pooh and Piglet tried to catch the heffalump, they didn't catch it, did they? No. Pooh couldn't, because he hasn't any brain. Did I catch it? Well, that comes into the story. Christopher Robin nodded. I do remember, he said. Only Pooh doesn't very well, so that's why he likes having it told to him again. Because then it's a real story and not just remembering. That's just how I feel, I said. Christopher Robin gave a deep sigh, picked his bear up by the leg and walked off to the door, trailing Pooh behind him. At the door he turned and said, Coming to see me have my bath? I might, I said. I didn't hurt him when I shot him, did I? Not a bit. He nodded and went out, and in a moment 
I heard Winnie the Pooh, bump, 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 going up the stairs behind him. Chapter 2, in which Pooh goes visiting and gets into a tight place. Edward Bear, known to his friends as Winnie the Pooh, or Pooh for short, was walking through the forest one day, humming proudly to himself. He had made up a little hum that very morning, as he was doing his stoutness exercises in front of the glass. tra la la Tra la la, as he stretched up as high as he could, and then, tra la la, tra la, oh, help, la, as he tried to reach his toes. After breakfast, he had said it over and over to himself until he had learned it off by heart, and now he was humming it right through properly. It went like this. Tra la la, tra la la, tra la la, tra la la, ram tum tittle um tum, tittle iddle, tittle iddle, tittle iddle, tittle iddle, ram tum tum tittle um. Well, he was humming this hum to himself, and walking along gaily, wondering what everybody else was doing, and what it felt like being somebody else, when suddenly he came to a sandy bank and in the bank was a large hole. Aha, said Pooh, rum tum tiddle lum tum If I know anything about anything, that hole means rabbit, he said, and rabbit means company, he said, and company means food and listening to me humming and such like, rum tum tum tiddle lum so he went down, put his head into the hole, and called out, Is anybody at home? There was a sudden scuffling noise from inside the hole, and then silence. What I said was, Is anybody at home? called out Pooh very loud. No, said a voice, and then added, You needn't shout so loud, I heard you quite well the first time. Bother, said Pooh, isn't there anybody here at all? Nobody. Winnie the Pooh took his head out of the hole and thought for a little, and he thought to himself, there must be somebody there, because somebody must have said nobody. So he put his head back in the hole and said, Hello, Rabbit, isn't that you? No, said Rabbit, in a different sort of voice this time. But isn't that Rabbit's voice? I don't think so, said Rabbit. It isn't meant to be. Oh, said Pooh. He took his head out of the hole and had another think, and then he put it back and said, Well, could you very kindly tell me where Rabbit is? He has gone to see his friend Pooh Bear, who is a great friend of his. But this is me, said Bear, very much surprised. What sort of me? Pooh Bear. Are you sure? said Rabbit, still more surprised. Quite, quite sure, said Pooh. Oh, well, then come in. So Pooh pushed and pushed, and pushed his way through the hall, and at last he got in. You were quite right, said Rabbit, looking at him all over. It is you. Glad to see you. 
who did you think it was? Well, I wasn't sure. You know how it is in the forest. One can't have anybody coming into one's house. One has to be careful. What about a mouthful of something? Pooh always liked a little something at eleven o'clock in the morning. And he was very glad to see Rabbit getting out the plates and mugs. And when Rabbit said, Honey or condensed milk with your bread? He was so excited that he said, Both. And then, so as not to seem greedy, he added, But don't bother about the bread, please. And for a long time after that, he said nothing. Until at last, humming to himself in a rather sticky voice, he got up, shook Rabbit lovingly by the paw, and said that he must be going on. Must you? said Rabbit politely. Well, said Pooh, I could stay a little longer if it... if you... and he tried very hard to look in the direction of the ladder. As a matter of fact, said Rabbit, I was going out myself directly. Oh, well, then, I'll be going on. Goodbye. Well, goodbye, if you're sure you won't have any more. Is there any more? asked Pooh quickly. Rabbit took the covers off the dishes and said, No, there wasn't. I thought not, said Pooh, nodding to himself. Well, goodbye, I must be going on. So he started to climb out of the hole. He pulled with his front paws, and he pushed with his back paws, and in a little while his nose was out in the open again. And then his ears, and then his front paws, and then his shoulders. And then, oh, help, said Pooh, I'd better go back. Oh, bother, said Pooh, I shall have to go on. I can't do either, said Pooh. Oh, help and bother. Now, by this time, Rabbit wanted to go for a walk too, and finding the front door full, he went out by the back door and came round to Pooh and looked at him. Hello, are you stuck? he asked. No, said Pooh carelessly. Just resting and thinking and humming to myself. Here, give us a paw. Pooh Bear stretched out a paw, and Rabbit pulled and pulled and pulled. Oh, cried Pooh, you're hurting. The fact is, said Rabbit, you're stuck. It all comes, said Pooh crossly, of not having front doors big enough. It all comes said Rabbit sternly, of eating too much. I thought at the time, said Rabbit, only I didn't like to say anything, said Rabbit, that one of us was eating too much, said Rabbit. And I knew it wasn't me, he said. Well, well, I shall go and fetch Christopher Robin. Christopher Robin lived at the other end of the forest. And when he came back with Rabbit and saw the front half of Pooh, he said, Silly old bear, in such a loving voice that everybody felt quite hopeful again. I was just beginning to think, said Bear, sniffing slightly, that Rabbit might never be able to use his front door again. And I should hate that, he said. So should I, said Rabbit. Use his front door again? said Christopher Robin. Of course he'll use his front door again. Good, said Rabbit. If we can't pull you out, Pooh, we might push you back. Rabbit scratched his whiskers thoughtfully and pointed out that when once Pooh was pushed back, he was back. And of course nobody was more glad to see Pooh than he was. Still, there it was. Some lived in trees, and some lived on the ground, and... You mean I'd never get out, said Pooh. 
I mean, said the rabbit, that having got so far, it seems a pity to waste it. Christopher Robin nodded. Then there's only one thing to be done, he said. We shall have to wait for you to get thin again. How long does getting thin take? asked Pooh, anxiously. About a week, I should think. But I can't stay here for a week. You can stay here all right, silly old bear. It's getting you out which is so difficult. We'll read to you, said Rabbit cheerfully. And I hope it won't snow, he added. And I say, old fellow, you are taking up a good deal of room in my house. Do you mind if I use your back legs as a towel horse? Because, I mean, there they are, doing nothing, and it would be very convenient just to hang the towels on them. A week, said Pooh gloomily. What about meals? I'm afraid no meals, said Christopher Robin, because of getting thin quicker. But we will read to you. Bear began to sigh, and then found he couldn't because he was so tightly stuck, and a tear rolled down his eye as he said, Then would you read a sustaining book, such as would help and comfort a wedged bear in great tightness? So for a week Christopher Robin read that sort of book at the north end of Pooh, and Rabbit hung his washing on the south end. And in between, Bear felt himself getting slenderer and slenderer. And at the end of the week, Christopher Robin said, No. So he took hold of Pooh's front paws, and Rabbit took hold of Christopher Robin, and all Rabbit's friends and relations took hold of Rabbit, and they all pulled together. And for a long time, Pooh only said, Oh, and... Oh, and then, all of a sudden, he said, Pop, just as if a cork were coming out of a bottle. And Christopher Robin and Rabbit and all Rabbit's friends and relations went head over heels backwards. And on the top of them came Winnie the Pooh, free. So, with a nod of thanks to his friends, he went on with his walk through the forest humming proudly to himself, but Christopher Robin looked after him lovingly and said to himself, Silly old bear. Chapter 3 In which Pooh and Piglet go hunting and nearly catch a woozle. And the Piglet lived in a very grand house in the middle of a beech tree. And the beech tree was in the middle of the forest. And the Piglet lived in the middle of the house. Next to his house was a piece of broken board which had Trespassers V on it. When Christopher Robin asked the piglet what it meant. He said it was his grandfather's name and had been in the family for a long time. Christopher Robin said you couldn't be called trespassers were. And piglet said yes, you could, because his grandfather was. And it was short for trespassers will, which was short for trespassers William. And his grandfather had had two names in case he lost one, Trespassers after an uncle, and William after Trespassers. I've got two names, said Christopher Robin carelessly. Well, there you are. That proves it, said Piglet. One fine winter's day, when Piglet was brushing away the snow in front of his house, he happened to look up, and there was Winnie the Pooh. 
Pooh was walking round and round in a circle, thinking of something else. And when Piglet called to him, he just went on walking. Hello, said Piglet, what are you doing? Hunting, said Pooh. Hunting what? Tracking something, said Winnie the Pooh very mysteriously. Tracking what? said Piglet, coming closer. That's just what I ask myself. I ask myself, what? What do you think you'll answer? I shall have to wait until I catch up with it, said Winnie the Pooh. Now, look there. He pointed to the ground in front of him. What do you see there? Tracks, said Piglet. Paw marks. He gave a little squeak of excitement. Oh, Pooh, do you think it's a, a, a woozle? It may be, said Pooh. Sometimes it is, and sometimes it isn't. You never can tell with paw marks. With these few words, he went on tracking, and Piglet, after watching him for a minute or two, ran after him. Winnie the Pooh had come to a sudden stop and was bending over the tracks in a puzzled sort of way. What's the matter? asked Piglet. It's a very funny thing, said Bear, but there seem to be two animals now. This, whatever it was, has been joined by another, whatever it is, and the two of them are now proceeding in company. Would you mind coming with me, Piglet, in case they turn out to be hostile animals? Piglet scratched his ear in a nice sort of way, and said that he had nothing to do until Friday, and would be delighted to come, in case it really was a woozle. You mean in case it really is two woozles, said Winnie the Pooh, and Piglet said that anyhow he had nothing to do until Friday. So off they went together. There was a small spinny of large trees just here, and it seemed as if the two woozles, if that is what they were, had been going round this spinny. So round the spinny went Pooh and Piglet after them, Piglet passing the time by telling Pooh what his grandfather, trespassers were, had done to remove stiffness after tracking, and how his grandfather, trespassers were, had suffered in his later years from shortness of breath, and other matters of interest, and Pooh wondering what a grandfather was like, and if perhaps this was two grandfathers they were after now, and, if so, whether he would be allowed to take one home and keep it, and what Christopher Robin would say. And still, the tracks went on in front of them. Suddenly, Winnie the Pooh stopped and pointed excitedly in front of him. Look! What? said Piglet with a jump. And then, to show that he hadn't been frightened, he jumped up and down once or twice more in an exercising sort of way. The tracks, said Pooh, a third animal has joined the other two. Pooh, cried Piglet, do you think it is another woozle? No, said Pooh, because it makes different marks. It is either two woozles and one, as it might be, whizzle, or two, as it might be, whizzles and one, if so it is, woozle. Let us continue to follow them. So they went on feeling just a little anxious now, in case the three animals in front of them were of hostile intent. And Piglet wished very much that his grandfather, T.W., were there, instead of elsewhere, and Pooh thought how nice it would be if they met Christopher Robin suddenly, but quite accidentally, and only because he liked Christopher Robin so much. And then, all of a sudden, Winnie the Pooh stopped again, and licked the tip of his nose in a cooling manner, for he was feeling more hot and anxious than ever in his life before. 
There were four animals in front of them. Do you see, Piglet? Look at the tracks. Three, as it were, woozles, and one, as it was, whistle. Another woozle has joined them. And so it seemed to be. And there were the tracks, crossing over each other here, getting muddled up with each other there. But quite plainly, every now and then, the tracks of four sets of paws. I think, said Piglet, when he had licked the tip of his nose too, and found that it brought very little comfort. I think that I have just remembered something. I have just remembered something that I forgot to do yesterday, and shan't be able to do tomorrow. So I suppose I really ought to go back and do it now. We'll do it this afternoon, and I'll come with you, said Pooh. It isn't the sort of thing you can do in the afternoon, said Piglet quickly. It's a very particular morning thing. That has to be done in the morning, and, if possible, between the hours of... What would you say the time was? About twelve, said Winnie the Pooh, looking at the sun. Between, as I was saying, the hours of twelve and twelve-five. So really, dear old Pooh, if you'll excuse me, what's that? Pooh looked up at the sky, and then, as he heard the whistling again, he looked up into the branches of a big oak tree, and then he saw a friend of his. It's Christopher Robin, he said. Ah, then you'll be all right, said Piglet. You'll be quite safe with him. Goodbye and he trotted off home as quickly as he could, very glad to be out of all danger again. Christopher Robin came slowly down his tree. Silly old bear, he said, what were you doing? First you went round the spinny twice by yourself, and then Piglet ran after you, and you went round again together, and then you were just going round the fourth time. Wait a moment said Winnie the Pooh, holding up his paw. He sat down and thought, in the most thoughtful way he could think. Then he fitted his paw into one of the tracks, and then he scratched his nose twice and stood up. Yes, said Winnie the Pooh. I see now, said Winnie the Pooh. I have been foolish and deluded, said he and I am a bear of no brain at all. You are the best bear in all the world, said Christopher Robin soothingly. Am I? said Pooh hopefully, and then he brightened up suddenly. Anyhow, he said, it is nearly luncheon time. So he went home for it. Chapter 4 In which Eeyore loses a tail, and Pooh finds one. The old grey donkey, Eeyore, stood by himself in a thistly corner of the forest. His front feet were well apart, his head on one side, and thought about things. Sometimes he thought sadly to himself, why? And sometimes he thought, wherefore? And sometimes he thought, inasmuch as which? And sometimes he didn't quite know what he was thinking about. So, when Winnie the Pooh came stumbling along, Eeyore was very glad to be able to stop thinking for a little, in order to say, how do you do? in a gloomy manner, to him. "'And how are you?' said Winnie the Pooh. 
Eeyore shook his head from side to side. Not very how, he said. I don't seem to have felt at all how for a long time. Dear, dear, said Pooh, I'm sorry about that. Let's have a look at you. So Eeyore stood there, gazing sadly at the ground, and Winnie the Pooh walked all around him once. Why, what happened to your tail? he said in surprise. What has happened to it? said Eeyore. It isn't there. Are you sure? Well, either a tail is there or it isn't there. You can't make a mistake about it, and yours isn't there. Then what is? Let's have a look, said Eeyore, and he turned slowly round to the place where his tail had been a little while ago. And then, finding that he couldn't catch it up, he turned round the other way until he came back to where he was at first, and then he put his head down and looked between his front legs. And at last, he said, with a long, sad sigh, I believe you're right. Of course I'm right, said Pooh. That accounts for a good deal, said Eeyore gloomily. It explains everything. No wonder. You must have left it somewhere, said Winnie the Pooh. Somebody must have taken it, said Eeyore. How like them, he added after a long silence. Pooh felt that he ought to say something helpful about it, but didn't quite know what. So he decided to do something helpful instead. Eeyore, he said solemnly, I, Winnie the Pooh, will find your tail for you. Thank you, Pooh, answered Eeyore. You're a real friend, said he. Not like some, he said. So Winnie the Pooh went off to find Eeyore's tail. It was a fine spring morning in the forest as he started out. Little soft clouds played happily in the blue sky skipping from time to time in front of the sun as if they had come to put it out, and then sliding away suddenly so that the next might have his turn. Through them and between them the sun shone bravely, and the copse, which had worn its furs all the year round, seemed old and dowdy now beside the new green lace which the beeches had put on so prettily. Through Cops and Spinney marched bare, down open slopes of gorse and heather, over rocky beds of streams, up steep banks of sandstone, into the heather again, and so at last, tired and hungry, to the Hundred Acre Wood. For it was in the Hundred Acre Wood that Owl lived. And if anyone knows anything about anything, said Bear to himself. It's Owl who knows something about something, he said. Or my name's not Winnie the Pooh, he said. Which it is, he added. So there you are. Owl lived at the Chestnuts, an old world residence of great charm, which was grander than anybody else's, or seemed so to bear because it had both a knocker and a bell pole. Underneath the knocker there was a notice which said, Please ring if an answer is required. Underneath the bell pole there was a notice which said, Please knock if an answer is not required. These notices had been written by Christopher Robin, who was the only one in the forest who could spell. For Owl, wise though he was in many ways, able to read and write and spell his own name, W-O-L, Wow, yet somehow went all to pieces 
over delicate words like measles and buttered toast. Winnie the Pooh read the two notices very carefully, first from left to right, and afterwards, in case he had missed some of it, from right to left. Then, to make quite sure, he knocked and pulled the knocker. And he pulled and knocked the bell rope. And he called out in a very loud voice, Owl, I require an answer. It's Bear speaking. And the door opened, and Owl looked out. Hello, Pooh, he said. How's things? Oh, terrible and sad, said Pooh, because Eeyore, who is a friend of mine, has lost his tail. And he's moping about it. So could you very kindly tell me how to find it for him? Well, said Owl, the customary procedure in such cases is as follows. What does Krusty Moni proceed cake mean? said Pooh, for I am a bear of very little brain, and long words bother me. It means the thing to do. As long as it means that, I don't mind, said Pooh humbly. The thing to do is as follows. First, issue a reward. Then, just a moment, said Pooh, holding up his paw. What do we do to this, what you were saying? You sneezed just as you were going to tell me. I didn't sneeze. Yes, you did, Owl. Excuse me, Pooh, I didn't. You can't sneeze without knowing it. Well, you can't know it without something having been sneezed. What I said was, first, issue a reward. You're doing it again, said Pooh sadly. A reward, said Owl very loudly. We write a notice to say that we will give a large something to anybody who finds Eeyore's tail. I see, I see said Pooh, nodding his head. Talking about large somethings, he went on dreamingly. I generally have a small something about now, about this time in the morning. And he looked wistfully at the cupboard in the corner of Owl's parlor. Just a mouthful of condensed milk or what not, with perhaps a lick of honey? Well then, said Owl, we write out this notice, and we put it up all over the forest. A lick of honey, murmured Bear to himself, or, or not, as the case may be. And he gave a deep sigh, and tried very hard to listen to what Owl was saying. But Owl went on and on, using longer and longer words until at last he came back to where he started, and he explained that the person to write out this notice was Christopher Robin. It was he who wrote the ones on my front door for me. Did you see them, Pooh? For some time now, Pooh had been saying, yes, and no, in turn, with his eyes shut to all that Owl was saying, and having said, yes, yes, last time, he said, no, not at all, now, without really knowing what Owl was talking about. Didn't you see them? said Owl, a little surprised. Come and look at them now. So they went outside, and Pooh looked at the knocker and the notice below it, and he looked at the bell rope and the notice below it, and the more he looked at the bell rope, the more he felt that he had seen something like it somewhere else, some time before. Handsome bell rope, isn't it? said Owl. Pooh nodded. It reminds me of something, he said, but I can't think what. Where did you get it? I just came across it in the forest. It was hanging over a bush, and I thought at first somebody lived there, so I rang it. 
and nothing happened. And then I rang it again very loudly, and it came off in my hand. And, as nobody seemed to want it, I took it home, and... Owl, said Pooh solemnly, you made a mistake. Somebody did want it. Who? Eeyore, my dear friend Eeyore. He was... he was fond of it. Fond of it? Attached to it, said Winnie the Pooh sadly. So with these words he unhooked it and carried it back to Eeyore. And when Christopher Robin had nailed it on in its right place again, Eeyore frisked about the forest, waving his tail so happily that Winnie the Pooh came over all funny and had to hurry home for a little snack of something to sustain him. And wiping his mouth half an hour afterwards, he sang to himself proudly, who found the tail? I, said Pooh, at a quarter to two. Only it was quarter to eleven, really. I found the tail. Chapter 5 In which Piglet meets a heffalump One day, when Christopher Robin and Winnie the Pooh and Piglet were all talking together, Christopher Robin finished the mouthful he was eating and said carelessly, I saw a heffalump today, Piglet. What was it doing? asked Piglet. Just lumping along, said Christopher Robin. I don't think it saw me. I saw one once, said Piglet. At least I think I did, he said. Only perhaps it wasn't. So did I, said Pooh, wondering what a heffalump was like. You don't often see them, said Christopher Robin carelessly. Not now, said Piglet. Not at this time of year, said Pooh. Then they all talked about something else until it was time for Pooh and Piglet to go home together. At first, as they stumped along the path which edged the hundred-acre wood, they didn't say much to each other. But then they came to the stream and had helped each other across the stepping stones and were able to walk side by side again over the heather. They began to talk in a friendly way about this and that, and Piglet said, if you see what I mean, Pooh. And Pooh said, It's just what I think myself, Piglet. And Piglet said, But on the other hand, Pooh, we must remember. And Pooh said, Quite true, Piglet, although I had forgotten it for a moment. And then, just as they came to the six pine trees, Pooh looked round to see that nobody else was listening and said in a very solemn voice, Piglet, I have decided something. What have you decided, Pooh? I have decided to catch a heffalump. Pooh nodded his head several times as he said this, and waited for Piglet to say, How? Or, Pooh, you couldn't. Or something helpful of that sort. But Piglet said nothing. The fact was, Piglet was wishing that he had thought about it first. I shall do it, said Pooh, after waiting a little longer, by means of a trap, and it must be a cunning trap, so you will have to help me, Piglet. Pooh, said Piglet, feeling quite happy again now, I will. And then he said, How shall we do it? And Pooh said, that's just it. How? And then they sat down together to think it out. 
Pooh's first idea was that they should dig a very deep pit. And then the heifer-lump would come along and fall into the pit. And... Why? said Piglet. Why what? said Pooh. Why would he fall in? Pooh rubbed his nose with his paw and said that the heifer-lump might be walking along, humming a little song and looking up at the sky, wondering if it would rain, and so he wouldn't see the very deep pit until he was halfway down, when it would be too late. Piglet said that this was a very good trap, but supposing it were raining already. Pooh rubbed his nose again and said that he hadn't thought of that, and then he brightened up and said that if it were raining already, the heifer lump would be looking at the sky, wondering if it would clear up, and so he wouldn't see the very deep pit until he was halfway down, when it would be too late. Piglet said that now that this point had been explained, he thought it was a cunning trap. Pooh was very proud when he heard this, and he felt that the heifer lump was as good as caught already. But there was just one other thing which had to be thought about, and it was this. Where should they dig the very deep pit? Piglet said that the best place would be somewhere where Heffalump was, just before he fell into it, only about a foot farther on. But then he would see us digging it, said Pooh. Not if he was looking at the sky. He would suspect, said Pooh, if he happened to look down. He thought for a long time, and then added sadly, It isn't as easy as I thought. I suppose that's why heifer-lumps hardly ever get caught. That must be it, said Piglet. They sighed and got up and when they had taken a few gorse prickles out of themselves, they sat down again. And all the time Pooh was saying to himself, if only I could think of something, for he felt sure that a very clever brain could catch a heifer-lump if only he knew the right way to go about it. Suppose, he said to Piglet, you wanted to catch me, how would you do it? Well, said Piglet, I should do it like this. I should make a trap, and I should put a jar of honey in the trap, and you would smell it, and you would go in after it, and... And I would go in after it, said Pooh excitedly, only very carefully so as not to hurt myself, and I would get the jar of honey, and I should lick around the edges first of all, pretending that there wasn't any more, you know, and then I should walk away and think about it a little, and then I should come back and start licking in the middle of the jar, and then... Yes, well, never mind about that. There you would be, and there I should catch you. Now, the first thing to think of is what do heffalumps like? I should think acorns, shouldn't you? We'll get a lot of... I say, wake up, Pooh. Pooh, who had gone into a happy dream, woke up with a start, and said that honey was a much more trappy thing than haycorns. Piglet didn't think so, and they were just going to argue about it when Piglet remembered that if they put acorns in the trap, he would have to find the acorns, but if they put honey... Then Pooh would have to give up some of his own honey. So he said, All right, honey then. Just as Pooh remembered it too, and was going to say, All right, acorns. Honey, said Piglet to himself in a thoughtful way, as if it were now settled. I'll dig the pit while you go and get the honey. Very well said Pooh, and he stomped off. As soon as he got home, he went to the larder, 
and stood on a chair and took down a very large jar of honey from the top shelf. It had honey written on it, but just to make sure, he took off the paper cover and looked at it. And it looked just like honey. But you never can tell, said Pooh. I remember my uncle saying once that he had seen cheese just this color. So he put his tongue in and took a large lick. Yes, he said, it is. No doubt about that. And honey, I should say, right down to the bottom of the jar. Unless, of course, he said, somebody put cheese at the bottom just for a joke. Perhaps I had better go a little further, just in case. In case heffalumps don't like cheese, same as me. Ah. And he gave a deep sigh. I was right. It is honey right the way down. Having made certain of this, he took the jar back to Piglet. And Piglet looked up from the bottom of his very deep pit and said, Got it? And Pooh said, Yes, but it isn't quite a full jar. And he threw it down to Piglet, and Piglet said, No, it isn't. Is that all you've got left? And Pooh said, Yes, because it was. So Piglet put the jar at the bottom of the pit, and climbed out, and they went off home together. Well, good night, Pooh said Piglet when they had got to Pooh's house. And we meet at six o'clock tomorrow morning by the pine trees and see how many heffalumps we've got in our trap. Six o'clock, Piglet. And have you got any string? No. Why do you want string? To lead them home with. Oh, I think heffalumps come if you whistle. Some do and some don't. You never can tell with heffalumps. Well, good night. Good night. And off Piglet trotted to his house, trespassers were, while Pooh made his preparations for bed. Some hours later, just as the night was beginning to steal away, Pooh woke up suddenly with a sinking feeling. He had had that sinking feeling before, and he knew what it meant. He was hungry. So he went to the larder, and he stood on a chair and reached up to the top shelf and found nothing. That's funny, he thought. I know I had a jar of honey there. A full jar, full of honey right up to the top. And it had honey written on it, so that I should know it was honey. That's very funny. And then he began to wander up and down, wondering where it was and murmuring a murmur to himself like this. Hmm, it's very, very funny, because I know I had some honey, because I had a label on saying honey. A galoptious full up pot too. And I don't know where it's got to. No, I don't know where it's gone. Well, it's funny. He had murmured this to himself three times in a singing sort of way, when suddenly he remembered he had put it into the cunning trap to catch the heffalump. Bother, said Pooh. It all comes of trying to be kind to heffalumps, and he got back into bed. But he couldn't sleep. The more he tried to sleep, the more he couldn't. He tried counting sheep, which is sometimes a good way of getting to sleep. And, as that was no good, he tried counting heffalumps, and that was worse. Because every heffalump that he counted was making straight for a pot of Pooh's honey, and eating it all. For some minutes he lay there miserably. But when the 587th heffalump was licking its jaws, and saying to itself, Very good honey this, I don't know when I've tasted better. 
Pooh could bear it no longer. He jumped out of bed, he ran out of the house, and he ran straight to the six pine trees. The sun was still in bed, but there was a lightness in the sky over the hundred acre wood, which seemed to show that it was waking up, and would soon be kicking off the clothes. In the half-light the pine trees looked cold and lonely, and the very deep pit seemed deeper than it was, and Pooh's jar of honey at the bottom was something mysterious. A shape, and no more. But as he got nearer to it, his nose told him that it was indeed honey, and his tongue came out, and began to polish up his mouth ready for it. Father, said Pooh, as he got his nose inside the jar, a heffalump has been eating it. And then he thought a little, and said, Oh, no, I did, I forgot. Indeed, he had eaten most of it, but there was a little left at the very bottom of the jar, and he pushed his head right in and began to lick. By and by, Piglet woke up. As soon as he woke, he said to himself, Oh, then he said bravely, Yes, and then, still more bravely, quite so. But he didn't feel very brave, for the word which was really jiggeting about his brain was heffalumps. What was a heffalump like? Was it fierce? Did it come when you whistled? And how did it come? Was it fond of pigs at all? If it was fond of pigs, did it make any difference what sort of pig? Supposing it was fierce with pigs, would it make any difference if the pig had a grandfather called Trespassers William? He didn't know the answer to any of these questions, and he was going to see his first heffalump in about an hour from now. Of course, Pooh would be with him, and it was much more friendly with two. But suppose heffalumps were very fierce with pigs and bears. Wouldn't it be better to pretend that he had a headache and couldn't go up to the six pine trees this morning? But then suppose that it was a very fine day and that there was no heffalump in the trap. Here he would be, in bed all morning, simply wasting his time for nothing. What should he do? And then he had a clever idea. He would go up very quietly to the six pine trees now, peep very cautiously into the trap, and see if there was a heffalump there. And if there was, he would go back to bed, and if there wasn't, he wouldn't. So off he went. At first he thought that there wouldn't be a heffalump in the trap, and then he thought that there would. And as he got nearer, he was sure that there would, because he could hear it heffalumping about it like anything. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, said Piglet to himself. And he wanted to run away. But somehow, having got so near, he felt that he must just see what a heffalump was like. So he crept to the side of the trap and looked in. And all the time, Winnie the Pooh had been trying to get the honey jar off his head. The more he shook it, the more tightly it stuck. Bother, he said inside the jar, and, oh, help, and mostly, oh. And he tried bumping it against things, but as he couldn't see what he was bumping it against, it didn't help him. And he tried to climb out of the trap, but as he could see nothing but jar, and not much of that, he couldn't find his way. So at last he lifted up his head, jar and all, and made a loud, roaring noise of sadness and despair. And it was at that moment that Piglet looked down. Help, help, cried Piglet, a heffalump, a horrible heffalump and he scampered off as hard as he could, still crying out, 
Help! Help! A horrible hoffer lump. Hoff! Hoff! A horrible horror lump. Ho! Ho! A hoffable heller up. And he didn't stop crying and scampering until he got to Christopher Robin's house. Whatever's the matter, Piglet, said Christopher Robin, who was just getting up. Half, said Piglet, breathing so hard that he could hardly speak. A half, a half, a half a lump. Where? Up there, said Piglet, waving his paw. What did it look like? Like, like, it had the biggest head you ever saw, Christopher Robin. A great, enormous thing, like, like nothing. A huge, big, well, like a, I don't know, like an enormous, big nothing, like a jar. Well, said Christopher Robin, putting on his shoes, I shall go and look at it. Come on. Piglet wasn't afraid if he had Christopher Robin with him, so off they went. I can hear it, can't you? said Piglet anxiously as they got near. I can hear something, said Christopher Robin. It was Pooh, bumping his head against the tree root he had found. There, said Piglet, isn't it awful? And he held on tight to Christopher Robin's hand. Suddenly, Christopher Robin began to laugh. And he laughed, and he laughed, and he laughed. And while he was still laughing, crash went the half a lump's head against the tree root. Smash went the jar, and out came Pooh's head again. Then Piglet saw what a foolish Piglet he had been, and he was so ashamed of himself that he ran straight off home and went to bed with a headache. But Christopher Robin and Pooh went home to breakfast together. Oh, bear, said Christopher Robin, how I do love you. So do I, said Pooh.